So welcome, welcome again, everybody. It's uh, 1013 on your radio dial here on a Monday morning. Um, and we assigned brand new project number 11. So let's get into that. Uh, why did it go to this? That's not where I wanted to go. Project 11. Well, okie dokie. Oh, here we go. Well, we'll just go into classwork. How about that? I'm not playing games here. Um, you'll see a brand new topic, a unit jumped into the Google Classroom when I assigned project number 11. This is our mastering unit. And then here's the project 11. So I came across this in searching for uh, new ways to use technology at home to continue doing what we're doing in class. Um, part of what we're doing in class right now, obviously, is mastering. So I, it's very difficult with the lack of software and plugins uh, from everybody across the board to make it an even playing field that I needed something a little more generic, but that still flexed your audio production muscles. So I found this competition, actually, and it's very interesting. It's by the New York Times. This is the third annual competition uh, for student podcasting. Now, you guys all have had, at this point, some experience with podcasting. Now, the question then becomes the quality of your podcast, right? Like, how am I going to record a podcast when I don't have the equipment? Well, I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 of you that means there's maybe 0.1% of one person that can't do this because they just don't know enough. But I think all of you have at least a phone. And so that's all I'm really asking. If you can get it to a phone, then you can get it to me. And you can get it to the New York Times. So here's where the flexing of the muscles I was talking about comes into play. There's going to be some, if you can't do any editing and mixing and all that stuff on a piece of software, then you're going to have to be extremely creative on how you end up producing this. You're going to have to really sit down and think this one out. It is a short turnaround time. It is due by May 17th. The due date for the New York Times is May 19th. So I gave you a couple of links to each one of these things, by the way, in this top sheet. Obviously, this is all digital top sheets. You don't have to print these out. You can, I made you a copy. Everyone gets a copy of this. You can follow the links. You can type back into the documents and then you can submit the documents to me as well as the audio file. The audio file that you might record at the very least on your phone, you can send the audio file to me via email or you actually can use it in a Google Classroom on your phone or iPad device or any device, really. Whatever you needed to record. If you want to record with a, a laptop speaker, I don't care. Do the best thing you can with what you have they're honestly not going to be looking at complete content quality. They're going to be looking at your writing, your, your preparedness, your ability to speak, your ability to conduct a podcast, have thoughts and ideas drawn out, explain them, speak well, do not stumble over your words, try not to use the word um too much. You know, basic oral communication skills is what they're looking for. So today, now more than ever, people are turning to podcasts to escape reality for a few minutes at a time. The New York Times is running its third annual student podcast competition. The answer is yes, there is money involved. You will write and develop a five-minute or less podcast on a topic of your choice. Now, let's make it appropriate, obviously. And if you're not sure of any ideas, well, guess what? The New York Times actually gave us an awesome thousand different writing prompts for students, topics that you can use in your podcast. And if you follow the link, you'll see there's a ton of stuff here. Look at all this stuff. You want to talk about technology, social media, smartphones, internet. You want to talk about arts and entertainment, music, television, video games, school and career, identity and family, social life. Look at all these. Science and health, civics and history. Look, here's all the questions in just the technology area. Is social media making us more narcissistic? <laughs> it's an interesting one. And if you can figure out what narcissistic means, then yes, you can answer that and you can talk about it on your podcast. Why you quit social media or would you quit social media? Um, do you use Twitter and why? Obviously, you have to come up with some sort of concept here. Here's stuff about smartphones and technology, internet and technology, arts and entertainment, favorite karaoke song, you know, why are artists considered sellouts or what artists do you consider to be sellouts? Who does hip hop belong to? Yeah, there's so many prompts yes, here. Sir, yes, sir. What would be considered inappropriate for this project, like uh, creating our own? 
like not using one of theirs? Um, it would have to be something that you'd be proud to stand up in front of a room of people that are judging you, which means uh, at the high school level, right. you're talking about in front of administrators, in front of your homeschool, in front of, with your parents in the room, you know, something that no one would be embarrassed to talk about or you wouldn't okay. get in trouble for in a classroom if you had to get up and do it, you know, live. Oh, all right. All right. So, you know, nothing crazy. Like I said, there's lots of prompts here. If you have a great idea and it's creative and it's appropriate for a high school classroom, then run with it. If not, this is All the right. reason why I assigned it to May 17th, because that leaves me a two day window that if it's not appropriate to be sent out to represent you and the school, then I'm going to kick it back to you. And I'm going to listen to all these on that Sunday. So you'll know, you okay, know, by cool. the time, and to be honest with you, Eric, if, if you go in and you do it early, hand it to me and I'll let you know if it'll work or not. Or if you want to email me yeah, it's probably gonna be a bullet point list of what you want to talk about, I'll let you know. Cool. Okay. If you need prior approval, guys, that's fine. Just uh, if you're unsure, um, then just, yeah, just email me or, or send me some information about what you want to do. Um, and then obviously the language you use is very important. But there's, a, you know, a lot of stuff here that you could use as a resource to find a question that you could talk about for God knows how long. Here's school and careers, by the way, if you want to go with that. Um, should we rethink how long students spend in high school? That's an interesting one. I like that one, actually. Uh, should kids head to college early? Nope. No way. Never going to make it. Um, but that's my, that's my opinion and my point of view, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for someone who is creative. They're looking for someone who can develop ideas and carefully lay them out in front of an audience and, and start working on it piece by piece, detail by detail. You know, if you go through this and just try to blab for five minutes, I don't think it's going to work. You really have to sit down and pre-produce and structure your ideas. And that's why I gave you all this area on this top sheet here. Now, when you're done, again, you're going to be submitting it to me uh, by the 17th. Um, and then you're going to be able to submit it to the New York Times right here at the very bottom. It says submit here yourself. But don't do that without prior approval before I can get to it and say you're good to go. Or I'll grade it and give it back to you on that Sunday. Chris, what's up? What if, for whatever reason, the project goes over five minutes? It can't. Part of the rules of the New York Times is it has to be five minutes or less. So if you go over five minutes, even by one second, it's not going to count. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So look, I'll, I'll even click. I'm going to click into the New York Times competition website. I gave you that link as well so you can see it. Um, teaching students how to produce their own podcast. Because we already went through this in a way in, when we did our radio show which is kind of like a podcast, though we went live, so you can see it a radio show. And then an archived version of that, edited and perfected, is what a podcast is. And usually it's in small, short form, obviously. And that's why they're trying to keep it under five minutes. You know, I've done podcasts that are three to four hours long. Joe Rogan does podcasts that are, you know, up to four hours long. And it's still considered a quote-unquote podcast. So how do we differentiate between podcasts and radio? Well, I think that has to do with the live element. If you're live... With the mics on and it going out to the internet or the airwaves, that's radio. If you're then archiving, editing, and perfecting, that's podcasting. That's how I always separated it in my mind. Um, so, yeah, here's a, uh, a bunch of stuff, uh, information about what's going on. It was updated on the 14th. And, again, the contest runs from the 9th to the 19th. So that's why I said this is like the, the end-all, be-all date. Now, look, if you don't submit it to the New York Times, I don't care. That's not part of my grade. Part of my grade is me getting it by the 17th. And then if I have to ask you to make changes or fix something or do something before you submit it, then that's fine. But at least it then gives you two days to make any changes that are necessary, if possible, or re-record it or whatever it is. And then you're going to submit this. I'm not going to submit it. You're going to submit it. Um, you know, and, and obviously, there's a bunch of stuff, audio editing, um, like I said, I've given you the resources for Logic and Pro Tools for free for 90-day trials. If you have a laptop, then you can actually use software. If you don't have a laptop, then like I said, you're going to heavily rely on all your pre-production to record to your phone or to record to a speaker on the top of an iPad or something. And just try your best to make it sound great. But they're really looking at information. So they also are giving you a lot of resources and content here about note-taking. 
um, warm up, you know, exercises you can do to get ready to feel comfortable speaking in front of a mic. Obviously, we've done a bunch of these uh, mini lessons about our radio show. Um, so all that information is in here. Storytelling is important. You know, how can stories we hear but can't see be sometimes even more powerful than stories dramatized or documented on TV or film? You know, very easily, uh, you know, The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan series that's been on ESPN these last few weeks is impactful, especially to people like me who lived through watching Michael between, you know, 91, 93 series wins and then the 97, 96, 7, and 8 series against the Knicks, who I was you know, a Knicks fan. Uh, still am, unfortunately. But, you know, to listen to those shows wouldn't be as good as to watch those shows. So, I mean, how do we make something that's worth listening to? And it's all about in how you speak, how you lay out your information, how you construct your sentences, how you put this all together in a, in a digestible form for people to listen to and be entertained from. When you don't have the visual element, people freak out. And you don't need to. It's all about that pre-production and laying out a good story, a good way of uh, coming at an angle or a good opinionated way of speaking. Again, it's all about just getting comfortable. And to do that, again, there's some really great resources here on how to interview people, um, keep them under a minute, how to wrap up at the end, a uh, mini lesson about you know just understanding the elements of a interview and composing look here here is using a smartphone to record huh i'm pretty sure all of you have a phone that can record voice so why you don't need a fancy microphone if you're going to focus on the content of what you're saying that's the big deal so and they even have free apps you know recforge and audio recorder where you could do a little editing on your phones um there's some of those out there that are free and then if you want to go into your software feel free some people might have a small, un, you know, uh, a disadvantage, and some people will have a small advantage to having some software at home. But again, if you can all have access to a laptop, you can all get free software. Uh, sound, uh, sorry, Audacity is free. Um, and right now, um, Pro Tools and Logic and Pro Tools First is free. So do yourself a favor and use all the resources necessary to get this project done. Okay, so on the line here, you're going to write your podcast title. Next, you're going to record your podcast by any means necessary. You can use software you may possess, free trial software that I told you, or even your phone. Below, you're going to write down some bullet points that you want to cover and the details that go along with it. This is your map. This is how you're going to carefully construct this podcast. Speak eloquently, speak well, clear, decisive, and have a list of ideas and a map to get there. Last, you're going to submit your recording and this top sheet via the Google Classroom for final approval before you will send it off to the New York Times via this link. So you'll have to follow this link here. And of course, you can upload it to a SoundCloud, but I'm pretty sure they have a, oh yeah, here we go, a podcast from home, or I'm pretty sure you can just email them. And so here's different ways right there to submit. Students ages 16 to 19 can submit their own entries using the submission form. Teachers, I can submit it for you if you can't do it, but I'm pretty sure you could if it was kids under um, 16. Also, please note that we have two categories for each submission, middle school and high school. High school, Make sure you guys pick high school, obviously. And then here's some of the guidelines. Obviously, the length of the audio file must be five minutes or less, Christian, as it says here. Your podcast must include a beginning, a middle, and an end um, to complete. So you have to pull that in. Listen, if you have a phone and you're looking for music, you can play music in the background out of another device if you really want some sort of mix. And what I would do is I'd practice that recording and practice the volume of the, uh, or the level of the device and see what works best where you can hear your voice clearly, where there might be stuff playing in the background. Um, like I said, it says uh, use any podcast format or genre. Things like interviews, conversations, nonfiction storytelling, even fictional storytelling. Popular podcasts include, but not limited to, Something Funny, True Crimes, News and Documentary, History, Radio Theater, Sports, all of that. Um, create your podcast by yourself or within a group. Well, we're not going to do groups. We're going to do individuals because we really can't get together and you know, collab on that. One submission per student. Use appropriate language. You can't submit anything that has inappropriate language. These are New York Times listeners. They do not use inappropriate information in the New York Times. 
maybe not correct information, but definitely not inappropriate. And then, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff where you can actually get sound effects if you wanted to use that. Um, there's some music where you can use the fair use exception. We can talk about that towards the end of the year. Upload, you can use SoundCloud or, you know, I think uh, Buzzsprout actually does free hosting, but you don't have to do that. You can actually just email it to them. And then, uh, like I said, that um, submission button is up here somewhere. So just follow all these links to where I put them and you will find everything you need. The biggest thing, obviously, for us is submitting your top sheet and your audio file to the Google Classroom by May 17th. Again, if you're not sending it off to the New York Times, you can be late with this, but you're going to lose points uh, very quickly. And you're also going to bury yourself because on May 18th, which is a Monday, we will have a brand new project. All right. Any other questions about project number 11? Yeah, I got one. Go for it. Uh, what about the copyright? Like if we're playing music off of another device in the background, will mm -hmm. that count as copyright if that song is, yeah? Yeah, good question. Um, right there in the New York Times, it says fair use policy. So when we get into a little bit of copyright and business stuff uh, towards the end of the year, sometime in June, uh, we discuss the use of fair rights, uh, fair use rather, um, where they will say, for instance, you're using it as um as being fair meaning you're not using that to make money a in this case it's competition so yeah you could earn money but um what they're trying to say is as a student you're kind of covered under some of these not as uh, an artist as as this is a school-based project you're covered under fair use okay. that's the way it works um if you okay. were to not do this in a in conjunction with a school if you were a 25 year old person trying to make it big in the podcast world and you used illegal music oh, then it's copyright could be that's copyright that's correct all right so unless you're part of ascap or uh bmi or some of these companies that allow you because you pay them to use the music so there's a you know the, all right and it has to be clean things. as well right oh yeah oh yeah that goes and along that with the uh that goes along with the appropriate language thing that they cited in okay. some of your terms all right, so I'm pretty much going through the guidelines of what the New York Times would want for what I would want. All right, so make sure that you, uh, yeah, make sure that you keep everything at a nice high school classroom level and not your, your version of high school, what the true version of high school should be, just appropriate language. All right, um, let's do a little mastering uh, intro today. I want to talk a little bit about it uh, at length, and we, I have a video that I pulled up from Isotope who has a dude who does a, a lot of mastering in his uh, life. I've actually watched some of his own master classes that he's produced about mastering over the years. And there's also been uh, a number of other resources that I wanted to click into, but um, I pulled this up on YouTube and it's a very short uh, video. But like I said, I, what I want to do is I want to stop and talk about it along the way. And then we'll also link this video into the stream so you can watch it again later. But it gives you a nice good idea of, and I know people on our mastering class, and, and I'll go back over here to our notes. We had questions about mastering um, from the previous master class. And so I'll leave those up as well so we can address them as it comes up and as we go through this video. All right, so I'm going to hold the mic actually. Uh, closer to the video or closer to my speakers because I think uh, a lot of times the uh, the sound from YouTube is not going through to the Zoom class directly. So I'll do my best to turn up my speaker and uh, we'll stop it along the way. So you might hear my mic move every so often when I'm trying to adjust it. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiner. I'm Chief Engineer of MWorks Mastering Studios, Director of Education for Isotope, and also Associate Professor of Music Production and Engineering at Berklee College of Music. And welcome to Mastering Month. This week, during Mastering Month, I'm going to be talking to you about the art and science of mastering. I'm going to give you some context and understanding about the history of mastering. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where it's come from, and therefore, I think you'll understand better how to do it. And you'll also understand maybe 
why it's different from mixing. Ultimately, I think this will help you do a better job mastering yourself. Mastering is important for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the things that mastering gives you is a chance to stop thinking about mixing and start thinking about what your mix is going to sound like to the consumer. When you're mixing, you're taking all of the different tracks you've recorded and putting them together to sound like a single thing, a song. In mastering, we're getting that song already mixed together. So we've only got the stereo file, the two tracks put together. So when you're mixing, you're thinking about you know, how can I get the tambourine to sound just right? Or how can I make the bagpipe sit properly? Or, you know, whatever the instruments are, you're trying to get each one to sound just right in the mix and really focusing on the individual players in the play, if you will. In mastering, we're really stepped back and looking at the big picture and thinking about adjusting overall tone, um, still thinking about how the pieces are fitting together, but we're looking at the whole mix as a whole piece. We can't... So that to me was... Uh... You know, obviously what we've repeated and said uh, over and over and over again in regards to the difference between uh, mixing and mastering. So during the mixing sessions, during the mixing process, uh, you're really looking at individual tracks, getting them to be the best they can um, by themselves and then putting together with other pieces in that mix. And what you do is you're working towards this goal of finalizing the best possible blend of all of these individual uh, sources or um, voices or instruments or whatever it is to, to make them sound the best they can. Then when you go get to the mastering session, what you're doing is you're actually stepping back. You're leaning back a little bit and saying to yourself, how is this working as a global mix, and by the way, you can't unmix it at that point. You can't go in and say, oh, I need more tambourine. It's, you're working with a stereo file. Mastering is not working with the individual tracks anymore. See, that's one of the things that, uh, let's say, startup engineers do, that they'll sit there in their project, their mix project, quote unquote, and they'll try to master it there. That's not where you should be. <laughs> to do the mastering properly, you should be in a stereo file, one track of the entire song. And you might think, well, I can't do what I want to do there. Well, then you're not in mastering. You haven't completed the mixing stage. See, if you haven't completed the mixing stage properly, you can't get to mastering. If there are things that are lacking in your mixing stage, you should not be on to mastering. You should be staying in mix until you have an appropriate mix that you like where you're not sitting there listening again and going, I need more tambourine or I need more drums or I need a double or triple version of my, my vocals, whatever it might be. That is not mastering. That is still mixing. You have to separate it like different stages of a process. You build an engine of a car and you build the body around the engine. You can't build the body and then build the engine back and say, oh, I forgot the pistons. What? Now I got to take the whole thing apart. That's not the right process. So this is one of the things where I, I really did like, and we'll get to the questions in a few minutes, but that is part of the reason why, you know, we see this as a completely different position and job. If you're the mixing engineer, you shouldn't also then be mastering. You shouldn't be. I'm not saying you can't, but you just shouldn't be. Because like he said, it's an opportunity for you to step back and look at it differently. And usually the best way to do that is to give it to a different person. Someone else who with fresh ears doesn't know anything about the mixing stage and is looking at this as just a stereo audio file thinks that there are certain elements that need to be done or changed. And yeah, a lot of times a mastering engineer be like, dude, this is, you gotta, you gotta remix this. There's something not right with this, that, and the other thing. They'll send notes back and the mixing engineer would go back, they'll make all the changes and send it back, and then the mastering engineer would say, yes, perfect, now I can take it and run with it. We remix a track. Um, we can make helpful, small adjustments to it, but we can't really completely redo the track. We can't change the tempo of a track. We can't change the key of a track. These are things that are usually part of the mixing process and not the mastering process. At the heart of the mastering discipline are a couple of simple things that you can do. For instance, always listen to your original mix at a level that's matched with your mastered version. You might do things when you're mastering that increase the level on a meter and 
increase the sound coming out of the speakers. You need to make an adjustment so that when you listen to the before and after, you're actually comparing them in a way that's level matched. So let me explain to you what he's saying there, all right? So you take a mix file, a file that went through the process of mixing and bounced out to a wave file. And so there's your mixed file, not untouched by mastering yet. And you put that into a project. And then you go in and you do mastering to that file. And when you're done with that mastering, you go back to the mix project and put it in again. And then you listen to the differences between what you got and what you did. So you're looking at the file before and the file after. Now, obviously, and you're going to see it through this week as we talk about mastering and what to do with the plugins, you're going to see a jump and increase in volume, especially across the dynamic range between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. You're going to see some balancing of levels, some shortening of dynamic ranges, a lot of different things you can do to a track. So what he's saying is the original track you got and the master track you got are going to be different in volume. So what I want you to do is I want you to take that mix track and just crank it until it matches the level of the master track and then listen to them back and forth, A and B. A, let me hear the track I mastered. B, let me hear the mix, but cranked mix so it matches level. And you're going to hear some major differences between just turning up the volume of a mix project and actually going through the process of mastering. Going and using the right plugins, the right uh, coloring, the right flavors, those are all descriptors that are used to describe what happens when you finally get into a mastering session and do something to the original mix file. Let's hear what else he has to say. At the end of the day, whether we make a track louder or not, we also want to make sure that we're making it better. And the only way that you can tell that it's better is by referring back to your original track while you're doing your work. So it's important as a mastering engineer that you have a good reference material. The reference material should be other records that sound like the kind of record that you're making and also that is a good example of that. So it's important not only to listen before and after to your track and the finished result, but also to compare it to something else that's in that same domain. One of the things I recommend is that you just take some time after you're done mixing. If you can, step away for a couple of days and go back and listen to your mix. Using reference materials can certainly help because then you have some external point of reference where you're not just in your own environment of being the composer and the mixer and now the mastering engineer. Something else you can do is listen to your mixes in different environments. That's probably something that people do when they're mixing to get a different perspective. It's also helpful as a mastering engineer, just so you understand what the problems might be that you need to address in mastering. So all of those things can help you get a little bit of perspective on mastering your own mixes. So great ideas, things that I've learned along the way since my college days in mastering is, and he said you want a fresh perspective, but a lot of people aren't taking the three days off and then going back to the mix and listening to it again before they go into mastering. They're just going right into mastering thinking they could skip a step, right? And it really doesn't work out. You can definitely tell when people do the proper things versus not do the proper things. Um, so one of the things that he said was he listens to it or you're supposed to listen to it in different environments. And that's really very interesting. I've done this since, let's say, 1999 when I was doing recordings in a basement and mastering for local artists. Um, I would take that final file. I would, at the time, play it out of the speakers in my studio. I would throw a set of headphones on and listen to it there. And then I would burn a CD. I had spindles of CDs, of just throwaway CDs. I would go through so much media, burning one track, two tracks, five tracks at a time, and then going into my car and then listening to it in that environment, taking up to my home stereo system and throwing it in the multi-CD changer putting it in my DVD player and playing out of the television, putting it in a uh, Discman. Yes, it's a CD, portable CD player where you had headphones and listening to it there. Multiple environments listening to what you did. Sometimes you would find some weird stuff would happen. And that's not right. You don't want to sell a CD or sell a tape or sell a file that when they play it in the car, it sounds awesome. But if they play it out of their Alexa speaker, or out of their uh, computer speaker of the laptop or out of headphones, it sounds weird. 
It's, it's changed. You're not, that's not your job. Your job wasn't to make it sound different in every environment. Your job was to try to get it to sound as consistent in every environment as possible. You know, and what he's saying makes a lot of sense. A lot of us probably take for granted that the fact that we listen to it on our phones, play it out of the speakers, throw it in our cars, Bluetooth, or play it out of a smart device, it all sounds pretty much the same. You know, we understand quality changes between the speakers on our cell phones that stink and the speakers that are on a nice system. We understand those changes, but we take for granted the core of the song is still there. The guitars still sound blended in well. The vocals are still prominent in the mix. The effects that were used are still there. And the total volume and dynamic range is exactly where it should be on every single device. And those are things that the mastering engineer accomplished. Those are steps and things they did to get to that final level. Um, so then this guy also did like longer form versions of this. So we'll go and refer to this a little bit. Um, he talks about the, obviously the basics, which is what I wanted to cover today. We'll skip around a little bit because there's some here, but you can see he has other episodes, episode two, episode three. So if you are interested in knowing more about mastering, he really does go in depth with this. I've watched the entire lessons uh, or set of lessons at this point, um, as well as other ones he's done. Uh, Isotope has some really great resources on their website. This is a reason, another reason why I bought into a lot of the Isotope plugins because they do use them in these. So if you wanted to follow along like you're a student at an actual you know, uh, class, you can do that. Um, but I just wanna kind of cover the basics right now. And in this one, he really starts separating out the concepts and what he's looking to do. And you're gonna hear actually some examples uh, through his system on things that are softer, medium, louder, and how he got to that point. He'll start breaking it down a little bit more. So I wanted to start with uh, that one, which was just an overview, but this one's a little more in depth and we'll take this for the rest of the class and we'll stop it along the way, like I said. Listening room uh, in the Cambridge campus. And welcome to episode one of our master class we are calling, Are You Listening? And this first week, we're going to be talking about audio mastering basics. I'm going to spend a little time kind of laying out a little bit about what mastering is, what the discipline is, and hopefully we'll provide a little context for what we'll be talking about in the subsequent episodes. I invite you to look at our website, take a look at all of our blogs, other educational materials. I expect everybody's here because they want to understand either how to make their stuff sound better or how to get it out into the world in good shape, which is maybe a lead into what mastering is in the first place. So I hope you find it interesting. Let's dive right into audio mastering basics. Before I start spitting out lots and lots of words about mastering, let's do a little listening. We've got some examples for you to listen to. When you're engaged in mastering, ultimately you're trying to make decisions about whether to change something, whether it needs to sound different in one way or another. So listen to these examples and see what you notice. So what did you just hear? If you listen to the first version of the song and the second version of the song, they sound different. In what way? Obviously, one's louder than the other. But which one is set to the right level? And so one of the things that I thought were, well, I'll turn it down. I turned myself up a little bit. One of the things I thought that was very interesting to what he was doing, uh, and I know, again, probably through the microphone, you didn't hear the biggest difference, um, was that there was several times on all three of those versions where you were like, oh, this is the mastered version. And then the next one would come in and be like, oh, wait, maybe not. And then you'd hear it again. You'd be like, oh, no, this is, this is the one. Oh, wait, no, it's not. Now, he wasn't trying to trick you. He actually brought you from version one to version two to version three, which was this progressive movement of volume and quality. And you can even hear some excitement. Um, some of the high end start to pop out through the mix. Again, what I'm going to do is I'll link these um, videos, by the way, to our 
stream so you guys can go back and, and listen to some of the things that we talked about today. Um, but this is what a mastering engineer does. He takes those deliberate steps from point A to point B that get him to that industry standard sound. And I think that was the key to what he was trying to show anybody that's watching this. Which one was the master version? Which one ended up being good, too good, not as good enough? Let's hear what he has to say. Is the louder one better? And in what way are they different? These are some of the things that we always need to be thinking about in mastering. The third version that you heard was the mastered version. I'd like you to go back and compare the unmastered to the mastered version and see what you notice that's different about it. Ultimately, your goal, I assume, is to get better at doing this or at least understanding what mastering does for a track so that we can really get into the subtle nuances and make a song sing, if you will, you know, make it sound as good as possible and communicate whatever it is that you or the artist is trying to communicate. However, you've got to start somewhere. So listen to these next two examples. And I bet that every person who's listening, no matter what platform you're listening on, will hear that something needs to change. So in that one, obviously, the minute you listen to it, especially out of even now the microphone and these speakers, um, there's no low end. The guitar sounds like flat, tinny, nothing in the low end, and the vocals sound like it's being sung through an AM radio. So obviously, there are things that need to change there. Let's hear another example. Hello, we can push play now. My time with my heart, with my skill, or lack thereof. When did it all begin? Tell me what kind of state we're in. Okay, on this example, again, you guys may not be getting it translated well through my mic to your device, but now it's kind of muddy. There's a lot going on. It doesn't sound terrible. No one would go, look. But from a quality standpoint, you kind of want to balance between what we heard at the beginning, which was very high-end frequencies, to now this sounds like it's a loss of clarity in the recording. Um, there's another example, and let's hear. Obviously, one of those tracks had way too much low end, or at least it didn't have any top end. And the other track was way too bright. And everybody out there can recognize it. So this is one of the most basic things that we think about when we're adjusting in mastering. I assume that everybody out there has some experience mixing. And you know how hard it is dealing with balance and the color, the snare drum and the collision between the snare drum and the, the vocal and all of that's mixing. That's what mixing is. It's really hard to focus on that and at the same time be thinking about the tone, the shape, the tonal balance, if you will. That's what we think about as mastering. So while you're listening to that track that we've just heard, you can immediately tell that's got too much bass or that's got too much treble. It's really much harder to do that when you're mixing. So he's right. Um, when you're mixing, as we mentioned, you are really trying to... Um, you're trying to isolate each track to get to be the best it can and then slowly blend it in with others. And by the time you're done at the very end there, what you're probably going to end up having is some sort of imbalance because you spent time building up, building up, building up to all your tracks are playing through. But if you don't take the next step in the mixing session to try to, you know, really brighten up the highs or like he said, a lot too much low end and then use mastering as a way to kind of rebalance the equation. In the mixing stage, again, you're listening to this day after day, hour after hour, you may be kind of numb to the fact that it's lost a little bit of its high end. And so that could lend itself to having either A, a new person come into the equation here to do your mastering, or B, you taking time off, listening to other music in other places, and then coming back into the studio and listening to it again and going, ugh. And the other thing that he also talked about 
was having a reference track, which is a huge part of mastering. Reference tracking is important. If I'm mixing and creating hip hop music, when I master that hip hop track, I'm going to bring in another hip hop track from an already mastered session. Something that was already done previously that's out there and sounds great and you like and it's comparable to what you're mixing and mastering. And I'm going to put it in the project. And I'm going to listen to the reference track a few times to get an idea of how it sounds with the highs, the mids, the lows, the volume, the consistency, the mix between uh, you know, vocals and all that other good stuff. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my track and see how it compares to something that's already out there. I'm going to use it as a comparison to go back and forth. If I feel like my track doesn't meet the same quality that the reference track did in regards to the high end, then I know in my track, I'm going to have to work on the high end a little bit to try to get it up to the level of a track that's comparable in our industry that was already done by a mastering engineer. Now, obviously, it's not the same song. So you have to, uh, you know, basically change everything you can fix things that make sense and get it to a point where at the industry standard, you're sounding like other tracks that are out there. Now, this obviously goes on for another 10 or so minutes. So let's look at some of the mastering questions we can answer today just by what we saw in these first few minutes of this video. So should you only use three plugins when creating a mastering chain? No. That is not the answer. In fact, I've used one plugin in my mastering chain. And that plugin is a mastering suite from Isotope that has several different plugins built into it. A suite usually means multiple things. So could I have one plugin? Yeah, good. I could have one plugin there. Does mastering bring flavor? Could. Um, we're not going to answer all these, though, to the extent of which I want to answer them today. But I just want to review them based upon what we saw. Uh, we just talked about mastering bringing flavor. He showed you the differences in the low end and the high end and, and what uh, from a mixed track to a mastering track could be. Uh, the volume, obviously. And then, of course, in that unmastered examples, one was too high, one was too low. So in order to bring back the low end or bring back the high end, we have to do certain things. How loud does the master track have to be in order to be ideal? We will get into that. That's important. It's not that it has to be a certain level, but it should, I, of course, meet industry standard um, levels. So the reference track can help you with that 100%. And of course, um, you using your skills in the mixer and with the VU meter can definitely help with that as well. And we'll get into all those details this week, starting tomorrow with Pro Tools. Uh, what are good strategies for mastering? Well, I think he covered a lot of that. You know, being um, a mixing engineer and moving through the mastering stages, we said we take time off from listening to it. Um, we put ourselves in a good environment. We listen to it in multiple different environments. Um, and of course, we use reference tracking. I think those are big things, but we'll get into more strategies as we go along. And what's the key difference between the mixing stage and the mastering stage and what should be done in each? So we, we actually absolutely dis discussed this already. Uh, mixing is multiple tracks, focusing on each track being the best they could and then working them into the mix. Mastering is working with literally the stereo mix. One track in your project, that's it. You're not looking at individual tracks. You're not looking at the snare and, and soloing the snare when you're mastering. Nope. You are taking the wave file, which is a stereo mix out of the mixing project and putting it into your project and working with just that one track, that one clip, that one bounce, and doing things to it to bring it up to the next level. That is the biggest difference. And that is the one question I will say that we answered at full today in regards to what mastering is and, and how it separates out from being a mixing uh, stage to a mastering stage. So I'm going to link this uh, video, like I said, into the Google Classroom so you guys can watch this. Also, I'm sure um, that you can go back in and watch that uh, beginning one too, which is a three minute one that we went first. Uh, where was it? It was over here. Yeah, what is mastering, right? So you can always go back. I'm not gonna link that one because that one you can find pretty quick, but I am gonna link this one 
um, the uh, whole point of the 13 minute one is to give you that first step into the world of mastering. He really debunks a lot of myths and he really breaks down a lot of the things that it is and it isn't. So just make sure that you, again, watch this uh, on your own as well. And as we go through this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and master in Pro Tools and Logic, we can start breaking down some of the thoughts and ideas that even he expressed. Uh, Alexis, what's up? Are you still doing notebook checks? So our notebook checks right now are based upon... Um, uh, wait, wait. Let me just finish this post and I'll show you. Uh, no, because we're not actually going to be able to submit a notebook to me. You're not going to be able to do that. So the integration math and science has now become our notebook check grades. So make sure you complete um, all of the math and science assignments that I put in there. If you do them and you try, and it shouldn't take you more than 10 to 15 minutes to do these, they're very easy, um, then you'll get 100 on them. And that'll be a nice 20 out of 20 on your notebook grade. Good. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to just put this uh, isotope and then we'll add the link here and then you guys can have it. I was going to post it before, but I didn't want anyone jumping over to it before we got there. Um, thanks, Lux. Uh, do, 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 do. So there, it's up in there. You guys can uh, watch that on your own at one point today if you'd like. Not truly the assignment, but does help with the um, lesson that we went through today. So I invite you guys absolutely to come back tomorrow at 10 o'clock because we will actually open software and start doing specific Pro Tools mastering. Then we will make the conversion from Pro Tools to Logic. And then by Thursday, we're doing full-fledged Logic mastering. And you're going to see some very different things happening in both. I think that's going to be the biggest push is to show you that Pro Tools handles mastering one way and Logic handles mastering another. And the differences are actually kind of crazy and your results are going to be different. So let's say you're somebody that really prefers logic over Pro Tools. Well, you better be careful. You don't start, you know, mastering quote unquote, or doing mixed masters like you would in Pro Tools in logic. I don't think that would work out better for you. I want you to make sure um, that again, that if you're not here for the lessons and any given day and any given time, that you go back to the archived versions on uh, YouTube and be able to um, watch and learn and take notes or write answers. I'll also put the, you know what, how about I add the mastering questions in there too? Because I think that will help you out as well just as we go along, being able to see exactly what we are answering and what kind of goals we're setting for ourselves for our project questions and again for in the end the questions that will be um on the test on friday and we will have a test on friday and please make sure you review the uh project that's due on sunday right it's due on sunday not next friday not this friday it's due on sunday because by tuesday you have to submit it go back through all the google classroom stream go back through all your classwork the classwork page We'll show you what you owe and what you don't. Oh, here it is, Alexis, by the way. Uh, math integration, you can see where it says NB for notebook. These are projects and these are quizzes. So it's 10, I'm uh, sorry, 20% notebook, 30% quiz, 50% project is how we get the grades over here to be what they are. And I'll uh, just slowly bring up, but you see overall grades are being generated as you submit stuff. So it's actually breaking it down into that 20, 30, 50 category. So that's how these, gener these grades are being generated. For the people that are doing stuff uh, consistently all the time, you're doing great. For the people who are not, um, and you're just throwing stuff in there, it's not helping you. And then there's a bunch of people, again, that are still missing. So right now they have zeros. And that's the mid-quarter report that went home. Anybody else have any questions about Project 11 or initial mastering basic concepts? Gad Vince, what's up, buddy? I have a question about um, Pro Tools compared to Logic. Sure. Why? Why was it like Logic needed so more, so much more for it to be a good mix compared to Pro Tools? 
um, the view meter algorithm is different. So I'm going to show you that tomorrow because I have to get into the software and open up preferences and show you how Pro Tools looks at VU meters and how that scale is done one way and how Logic does its VU meters and that scale is another way. So what Vince is asking is, you know, why are the VU meters different in both? Uh, because the default ones are different in both. The default algorithms for the VUs are different. So you're going to have to either A, know how to change them to make them more consistent, or B, just know how to adapt when you go from software to software. I'll give you a quick for instance. Vince, if it gets up to zero dB in Pro Tools, you're approaching distortion level. But in Logic, you can actually break zero and go all the way to 5.8 before it reaches a distortion level. So that's why, you know, they're a little different and the way the range and the scale works in each software is going to be different. These are the things that, you know, you got to start taking into consideration when hopping from one software to the next. All right. Anybody else? All right. Uh, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, right back here. Same bad time, same bad channel. I will see you all uh, tomorrow at 10. And any questions, just send me that email. Holla.